So um, Stephanie mentioned the objectives for today or the topic. Um, so what I want to make sure everyone comes away with today is uh, strategies to overcome complexities within your application landscape, things such as diverse access controls and security models. Um, how to ensure accurate risk assessments. Our expert, oh, that's me, <laughs> will supply practical recommendations for identity IT and application owners to enhance your program. So essentially, um, you know, we're only as good as the reports that we're looking at. So how do we ensure those are accurate? And then um, how a combination of risk simulations, rule set maintenance, mitigating controls, and detective risk reporting can help mature your AAG program. So how do you put all the pieces together as part of your governance program to go ahead and move through that maturity uh, model and scale so that you're continuing to optimize uh, your approach. So as Stephanie said, my name is Carrie Bowman. I'm a senior director of product marketing here with Pathlock. I also have my CISA. Um, I have 14 plus years experience, um, specifically leading risk and governance management program implementations, as well as performance improvements initiatives, product management and development teams. And um, I, in particular, I'm an SAP security SME. So that is my background. That's what I did for years before coming over to the software side of the house. I actually worked in consulting, focusing on that. So uh, that kind of leads into my approach whenever I do these presentations. I really like to make sure that I'm providing practical takeaways uh, that you can consider so that as you're building, implementing, and maintaining your governance programs, you have something useful that you can reference. So with that said, let's jump right in. I'll try to keep it to about 40 minutes today. So we'll have plenty of time at the end for questions and get you out of here before the top of the hour. So let's start by setting the stage. Business needs are evolving quickly. And with that comes the rapid expansion of line of business applications. Those line of business applications require access strategies to be effective. So we typically encounter three common situations when we engage with organizations to discuss access governance. First, oh, sorry, my did not mean to click that, apologies. Um, so first is that you're dealing with these significantly more distributed business processes, right? Um, that's because there is a proliferation of our line of business applications, right? Um, we have scale to consider as well as our processes being spaced across multiple applications. And all of these applications, we need to have that fine-tuned access, that fine-grained access visibility so that we can be effective, right? So Basically, we have a lot of processes, we have a lot of applications, and they're all different. Second, uh, when we're attempting to manage the controls for these applications and interconnected systems, if we don't have something automated, that means we're doing it manually. If we're doing it manually, that means we're doing it via spreadsheets. That means that there is human error and involvement. Um, that means that oftentimes we're outsourcing this to people who specialize in it, people like consultants who can help us untangle this. So what does that result in? Disparate tools, manual processes, a lot of cost, and potentially um, significant gaps in our coverage. And then lastly, what we found is that the lack of transparency and alignment across our functional teams when it comes to designing, enforcing, and reporting on our access, that can often create a friction in compliance and audit reporting. So you know, when we're dealing with a significant amount of disparity between applications, between security processes, between how we manage and monitor, that just causes a significant amount of difficulty. So what does this mean? In summary, access equals risk. Our application landscape is complex, it's difficult, and we still can't let that hinder us from addressing risk in our environments. We need to find some way to manage all of this. When we are trying to manage this, what are we dealing with? ever-evolving audit requirements, right? If you looked 10 years ago at our audit requirements, uh, ERPs were the focus of access auditing. So we're talking the major players, the SAPs, the Oracles, right? Um, your PeopleSofts, your major ERP systems were really where we were focused for audit. Well, what do we expect, you know, five years ago? Okay, well, five years ago, um, we started to see some line of business applications come into scope, right? Typically ones that were actually connected to the ERP. So Let's think about things like Ariba, right? SAP purchases Ariba, they start utilizing it. Companies start moving their invoices into Ariba and out of their main SAP monolithic system. Well, now we've got two interconnected systems with users in both systems and utilizing those. That starts to come in scope for audit. Now we care about that, right? We want to see what users can do in both locations. And then what do we expect to see going forward five years plus from now? 
Um, we really see the majority, if not all of our ERPs and line of business applications will start to be in scope. That will become the new normal for our access analysis and audit reporting. And that is a fairly dramatic shift and one that we want to start planning for now, right? Um, that's because as tools become more available, as we've had um, our regulations and standards around for a significant number of years, if we think about SOX, right? We've already had SOX now for 20 years. So we've had a significant amount of time to understand what we're expected to monitor and manage within our applications. And so now, rather than looking at those singular applications, we're starting to expand the breadth of what we're expected to report on and be, um, be aware of in context of risk. What does this um, lead to for us, right? Well, application security diversity adds to complexity. We talked about this before. We've got a lot of different applications. Why is it so difficult for us to manage risk? Um, it's not only due to the number of applications, but in particular, it's because of the complexity and the differences between applications that exacerbate this. So you can see here, right? We have a handful of applications across the top. And then down the left hand side, we have a breakdown of the data that exists within these applications, right? Our users, our roles, our actions, our permissions. So this table represents the challenge of trying to manage access across applications. If anyone ever asks you, why is it so difficult, right? It's because look at every level of each of these applications. The models don't line up. Yes, we have users across the top for both most of them, but some of these applications also consider profiles and groups and granted users. Most of them have a role of some type, but others also have dynamic groups or security classes or they're referred to as duties. So we've got different terminology as well as different groupings. And then that especially gets significantly different when we get down into the actions and the permissions. That's where the real challenge lies, right? because these are both the most critical piece for us when we're doing fine grain review, but also they're the most different, right? Um, and it requires someone with um, detailed knowledge of that application to understand that security permission structure. So myself with a background in SAP, I understand transaction codes, authorization objects, fields, and field values. I have some experience with Oracle, so I understand functions and menus. But I may be less familiar with something like a Hyperion where it's tasks and access rights. So you need someone with experience in each of these to truly understand the depth of the application and what that security permission structure is. And that's so important because to be able to administer these applications properly, as well as report on the access users have, we need to understand the core activities that each of these permissions and actions are granting to users. So. We need that fine grained visibility of the permission level so that we can properly see all of our, our risks. And once we get down to that level and we multiply it across all the applications we're looking at, um, what are we dealing with? A significant challenge of complexity, right? So that kind of sets the stage for anyone who's wondering why is application access governance so difficult whenever we're trying to do it for multiple applications? This right here. So how do we address it? Well, we first start by identifying our standardized processes and procedures. So anyone who knows me knows that I may be pedantic at times, but I find that having a standardized process and procedure, especially when we're looking at it from an audit perspective, that's really going to help us to just lay out the foundation for the steps that we're going to follow one, two, three, four in order to accomplish something. So our compliance strategies, we want well-defined, we want documented, and we want it to be consistently repeatable. So this is something that flows very nicely along with uh, the capability maturity model. If, for those of you who are familiar, right? We need to document first so that people can consistently repeat it. And then we look to advance and optimize that through things like automation. So let's set the stage. Where do we start with? Like I said, it all starts with the plan. Once we, once we address that plan, we can then move forward. So first things first, visibility. Right? We do not know what we do not know, and that is what concerns all of us. So first thing we need to do is gain visibility so that we gain insight into the details of the access provided to the users of each application. So that's the depth of access we were just looking at, right? We don't wanna just look at the role level or the user level. We wanna get down into those actions and permissions for each of the applications. So we truly see the access that users are being granted. 
Now, by having the ability to clearly report on users' complete access, we can then start to reduce our single and cross-application risks. We can do that by limiting users' access to only that which is required, and we can reduce that privileged access sprawl, right? So we like to call that the principle of least privileged access, right? Grant them what they need to do their job and nothing more. But to do that, we first need that visibility at the fine green level so we can see what they have access to potentially, right? So once we have visibility, that's gonna feed into our governance program. So now that we're aware of the access available to them, we wanna establish clear governance policies and procedures to be followed. So this should include our goals of the least privileged access model, this should include a focus on uniformly and consistently applying defined application access controls across the entire ecosystem and establishing the standards by which we will provision or deprovision access. So visibility, what can they do? What do they have access to? Governance, how are we going to standardly decide on and apply the ability for users to gain access to different things and uh, to utilize different things within the system? And then the next step is security. So we've got governance practices. Now we can implement them. We're looking for balanced real-time and risk-based security, right? So we wanna standardize and automate across our full application landscape um, with those compliance strategies that we've defined. And then that way we're gonna move forward in maturity, right? Visible, govern, secure. That's how we're going to address our access. So now that I've said that, these are all great concepts, but that's exactly what they are, concepts. How do we actually implement these? This is where we're gonna to come to the practical part of today's um, discussion, where I actually walk you through some steps that you can follow um, in your organization today, whether manually or with an automated tool. We'll talk about both of those and just talk you through how to actually implement some of this. So how do we start from the ground up? First thing that we're gonna do is we're going to talk about what risks are. How do we ensure accurate risk assessments? Well, first we need the visibility discussed. So that visibility comes in the form of what we call a risk rule set that we will use to execute our risk assessments. So a risk rule set includes what we refer to as SOD or separation of duties. You may also hear this called segregation of duties as well as sensitive or critical access risks. Again, how do we do a risk assessment? We use a risk rule set. A separation of duties risk rule set is where we identify separate business processes or functions that if someone is executing may be an unacceptable risk to the company's process. It could expose us to fraud. It could hinder our operations. Um, and because of that um, significant risk, we want to go ahead and monitor that and ensure that we're aware of every user who has potential access like that. What is an example of separation of duties? We see one here, create sales order and create invoice. What is the risk of this? Uh, you could potentially create fictitious or fraudulent invoices. The example I love to use because it's so very ability to create a vendor and pay a vendor. If I can create vendors or maintain them and pay vendors, I could potentially create a fraudulent vendor or change the information fraudulently and then pay someone. So I could set myself up as a vendor and pay myself. And therefore steal money, right? That is a separation of duties risk that we wanna be monitoring for in our environment. And then we have sensitive access risks. These are also referred to as critical access risks. And so this is just the ability where something in and of itself standalone is sensitive. This could be access to financial information, highly confidential information. Think about if we have an HR process, right? Only certain people should be seeing certain users information. Um, if we're an IT user, only certain people should have significant capabilities within the system to you know, debug or open and close systems or transport um, data between systems. That's very sensitive in and of itself. So we wanna monitor that. Another example here of a financial um, risk is the ability to reverse invoices. If we inappropriately reverse an invoice, we could impact our, our financials. So that's um, significant, it's sensitive, we wanna monitor it, period. So, a rule set, a risk rule set allows us to look at both of these type of risks and report on them. Now that we know that we need a risk rule set, how do we actually ensure that they are correct so that our risk assessments report on the right information? What we need our rule sets to do is go down to the action and permission level that we looked at previously. This is what is referred to as fine grain. So if you're not going down to the action and permission level and you're staying up there at the user role level that we looked at before, that's called coarse grain. And while that will show you potentially risks, 
you run a risk of something called false positives, right? Where you're not truly reflecting the complete access of someone because you have not gone down to that action permission level. So we're gonna want to create a fine grained rule set for our separation of duties and sensitive access type risks. Now, how do we do that? Um, we do that by building our rule set in a very uh, thorough manner. So this is how we actually build a rule set in practice. And I'm a, I'm a very visual person. So there's a couple of these visuals that I'll walk you through. So rule sets. Rule sets are made up of risks. For example, the ability to maintain both sales orders and invoices. This is the risk of someone creating fictitious fraudulent invoices that we just looked at. Now risks are composed of one or more functions. These are the conflicting sides of your risk. So in this example, one side is the ability to maintain a sales order and to perform invoice maintenance. And, uh, and performing invoice maintenance is the other side. The specific ability to create um, sales orders or change invoices, um, how do we actually figure out when someone can do this? We need to go down to the next level and some permission. So what is an example of an action? Well, if we're talking about maintaining a sales order, an action will be creating a sales order or changing a sales order. Um, now, what is a permission? A permission is the ability to create and the ability to change. So we build a rule set going all the way down to these very fine grain levels. We tell, tell ourselves what our risk is, we define the opposing functions, we identify the actions, and we identify the permissions. And so we actually need to then fill in the very specific information. And this is where that expertise in the individual applications comes into play, right? I'm an SAP security SME. I can tell you the transaction that will allow you to create a sales order and I can tell you the permissions, right? Value zero one in SAP allows you to create. Value zero two allows you to change. That's a di different type of permission when you're talking about Oracle or Salesforce or Ariba, right? So you're gonna need to work with your security expert to identify those specific values to make sure you're reflecting exactly the risk you wanna check for. And this goes back to that concept of coarse grain versus fine grain. Had we stopped at the role level or even at the action level, um, we're not getting all the way down to our permissions. So we may be getting those false positives. If I was only checking for the ability of someone to um, get to a sales order and I didn't check for the values of create and change, I may unintentionally report on people who can just display a sales order. And so I'm, I'm just adding um, extra noise to my reports, right? So this is the reason we go down to fine grained. What are we looking for, um, you know, to report on? So um, the rule sets for each application, and that includes cross application risks, right? Um, should go down to this fine grained level. There's an example here um, out of our system where you can see that we're checking for an SAP value of T code, authorization object field, and field value. And again, this ensures we're only returning actual risk results. Um, you can see that you have the ability to check for um, multiple other values. Oftentimes these rule sets um, can get quite large and that's because we need to make sure that we're checking for um, every, every value that's applicable to that risk. So in this example that you see here, this is maintain bank master data. We wanna make sure that any um, transaction and permission that is associated with, with that bank maintenance is reflected here and that's why we'll see multiple line items. So again, what are we learning here? If we want an accurate risk assessment, we need a fine-grained rule set for each application, and that's going to allow our reports to be accurate. What about when we're dealing with multiple applications? Cross-application business processes have unlocked best-of-breed solutions. This is true, right? They allow us to um, very specifically do exactly what we want, but what that does is introduce new access risks. This is because if our users, like in this example here, have access within and across multiple applications, now we need visibility again, not just within each of these singular applications, but now I need to know if I have one user that touches all of these applications, what can they do within each of these applications and is that causing a risk? So again, circle back, it all starts with visibility. Who can do what and can I see all of it? in the context of their complete access. How do we handle risk rule sets for cross-application risks? Again, I find visuals helpful, so that's what I'm gonna do here. So we still need to define our rule set and our risks. That's very straightforward, right? So we start with that piece, and then we need to go to the same granularity 
And in practice and execution, what happens is that each application sits within one of the functions of the risk. So our risk rule set now looks like this as we build it out. We've got one application on one side of our risk, one function, and one application on the other. And then what do we do? We go down to the next level, right? We're gonna bring in our actions. We're gonna go down to the next level and bring in our permissions. And what this is gonna do is build out our rule set for cross application risk for both of these applications for this risk. Same steps, same layout for our rule set. The difference is now we're just bringing in different values for different applications. And um, just as a call out here, please do not forget to include any custom functionalities that you may have built in your application. We want to ensure those are also considered for risks. So if you have built any custom act actions or custom permissions, and they are related to the risks that you're trying to report on, make sure that you go ahead and add those into your rule set. Um, a lot of companies, ours included, will give you an out of the box rule set for major applications, and that is a fantastic starting place, but you should always include your own custom functionality. We've built our rule sets. Are we done? Not quite. <laughs> so just in the same way that you should always customize your rule set, you should also always update your risk ranking. So what is that? Risk ranking is where we assess based on our organization's risk appetite, what each of our risks are going to be in terms of criticality. Uh, this is the example that I always use. Two actual companies I worked with, both of them are manufacturing, both of a similar size, and both were using the same application. One produced porcelain products and one made handheld tools. Both had a risk for being able to purchase and receive goods. For the tool manufacturer, this is a high risk ranking, right? That's because they could experience significant shrinkage and loss if someone were to order things inappropriately and receive them and walk away with them, right? However, for the porcelain product manufacturer, the goods that they were receiving were literal truckloads of dirt. So um, not nearly as likely to be stolen or someone to walk out the door with it. So it is technically the exact same risk for both of them in the exact same application, same actions and permissions, but the risk ranking is completely different. For the tools manufacturer, that's a high level risk um, that they need to monitor and address. For the, the porcelain manufacturer, that was a low level risk. They just reported on it. So this is a perfect example of how risk rankings can drive how we handle the risks that occur. We um, want to decide for each criticality, critical, high, medium, and low. Those are our four groupings, right? We wanna decide how we address those as a business. What is our risk appetite? For example, we may decide that critical level risk, we never allow those. If anyone flags for a critical level risk, we revoke the access that's causing it, period. Um, but we may decide that for high and medium level risks, um, if the business confirms that it is necessary for the user to retain the access, we'll let them keep it, but we have to apply mitigating control. Um, that mitigating control is going to be a report or a control of some, some type that basically allows the business to state, we are monitoring this and managing it. We acknowledge that this user has this access, but we have these things in place that are going to allow us to um, contain that and manage it. And then um, low level risk, sometimes we decide that, well, we'll just report on those, but they require no, no mitigation or no action. So that's an example of things you can take. I've seen customers that don't let anyone have critical or high level risks and they mitigate both medium and low. Um, so it's really up to the risk appetite of your company. And that's why it's so important to have this conversation to both define how you're going to handle each level of risk. And then also for each risk, doing that ranking. So when we talk about the ability to create a vendor and pay a vendor, to do a goods receipt and um, a purchase order, um, to do a sales order and an invoice. What is that risk ranking for your company? Uh, this matrix is a simple example of how you can calculate those scores when you review it with the business. You don't have to follow this. This is just one that I found to be easy in implementing with my customers. Um, all you have to do is rank based on likelihood and then consequences, and you rank them on one to five. So a likelihood of one to five goes from rare to almost certain. So let's think about that example of creative vendor and pay a vendor. How large is your AP? What is the likelihood that someone on your team is going to get access to that risk? They're going to be creating vendors and they're going to be paying vendors. If we have a small team, it may be a five, it may be almost certain. 
if we have a very large team, maybe it's rare. So that's how we get our likelihood ranking. And then similarly, consequences. This is consequences, meaning the impact to our company if this risk were to occur with no controls in place. So if we had no controls in place and someone were to create a vendor and pay a vendor, um, and so fraudulently take money from us, what is the potential impact of that? Um, is it low, meaning negligible? Maybe it's a negligible dollar amount. Um, maybe it's low, it's an operational impact, like it slows our operations down, but we're able to get them back fairly quickly so it's not overly dramatic. Maybe it's a three, it's a median, that could be reported as a significant deficiency. Um, maybe it's a uh, four, it's a material weakness. Or maybe it's a five, we have a financial restatement, right? That's how we can think of those risk rankings of consequences of one to five. And then it's as simple as multiplying them. So let's say that we have a large accounting department, so it's rare that anyone would have this access, that's a one. But if they were to have this access, then it could be um, extremely consequential because they could steal a lot of money from us. That makes it a five. So it comes out to a medium ranking. So at this point, that's whenever I would, sitting with the business, right? When you multiply it out like that, it's very easy for them to see, okay, I said it was rare, but it's extremely high consequence. That comes out to a five, which is a medium. Do we agree with that? And they may go, you know, now that I think about it, it's just so important that that's really addressed. It should be unlikely that someone has access and we should rank that a two, it's a 10, it's a high ranked risk, right? Or they may say, no, that's correct. Like we wanna keep it as a medium risk because of reasons X, Y, and Z, right? So it just really facilitates conversation with the business, gets them to understand why the risk matters and gets them to talk through it. Um, this is just a simple example of what these results can look like once you've completed this task. So, uh, you know, you can see the, the risk called out here. You can see both the opposing functions, how someone ranked the likelihood, the consequence, the total count, and the risk category. And so circling back to our goal for today, right? I wanted to discuss strategies for overcoming complexities in your application landscape because I want you to have accurate risk assessments. So let's take stock of where we've managed to get us so far. So what have we talked about? We know that we need to define a risk rule set because that's what allows us to perform an assessment. We know that we need both SOD and sensitive or critical access risks defined. We walked through how to build our rule sets down to a fine grain level. And now we know how to talk to our organization about risk tolerance and risk ranking. And so now what we have is something that we can either, if we're running it manually or if we're running it through a tool, we can execute our assessment and we're going to return proper and more importantly, accurate results in our risk reporting. So this is going to get us where the very first step we talked about visibility right so now we've covered off that goal of visibility so now what do we do with it governance and security are the aspects that come after visibility how do we implement the assessment that we've just completed we've run our risk assessment right so now we know what the scope of our our risk landscape is how do we get to that governance and security um, piece so that we're actually being compliant long term the best way that I found to do this is by following an approach that you will frequently hear referred to as get clean, stay clean, optimize. Um, now this is just essentially clear policies and procedures that if you follow them, you can execute these consistently and see solid results for maintaining your, your governance over your environment. Um, you can do these through manual processes. It is obviously much easier with automation and a tool. Um, but either way, the steps are still applicable uh, that you want to follow. So get clean. What are we talking about? Um, we've established our rule set, right? And we've ran our risk assessment. This is where we can then baseline our risk environment. So that's those first two bullets there, right? We now can look at our full landscape and say, I know the risks that are present in my system for both SOD and sensitive access. That's great. Now, what do I do with it? As auditors, we like to get to something called zero unmitigated risks, right? What that means is that I don't have any risks present in my environment that I am unaware of and that are unaddressed. So in order to do that, what do I have to do? I need to document the mitigating controls. I need to state, here are the controls that I have available in my business. Here are the risks that those controls mitigate. And then I need to go through and do step number four, address the risks in my assessment, address the risks in my report. 
And I do that through remediation or mitigation. Mitigation is straightforward. It says, Carrie has the ability to create a vendor and pay a vendor. I have a control where on a weekly basis, I run a report of all changes made to vendors. And I confirm that those changes were made by an appropriate person and the changes themselves were appropriate. That's a control. I can apply that to Carrie and say, this is great. She has to keep this access. That is just her job duties, but it's now mitigated. I've got something that's going to mitigate that risk for me. Um, or we can remediate, which says, nope, Carrie is no longer going to be able to do this. I'm actually going to take away her access and her ability to maintain vendors. Someone else is going to do that. Carrie can pay vendors all day long, but she cannot create or change any vendors. That's remediation. So at the end of that process, we should be in this get clean phase. It means at this point in time, we have a zero unmitigated risk environment for our full assessed risks. So this is fantastic. This allows us to go to audit and say, hey, we have full visibility and we have you know, addressed all of our risks, but that's point in time, right? So as soon as someone gets new access to the system, that report becomes stale. So what do we do? Depending on if we're doing this manually or with tools, if you're doing it manually, it may be only feasible to do this um, during your audit time periods, you know, once a quarter or twice a year, something like that. But um, with the use of a tool, we can make this um, proactive and interactive. And that's what we call the stay clean phase. So this is where we have the ability to do things like implementing access request workflows. So if you're doing this manually, this would be your process for how users request access and the steps that you follow for proper approvals before you actually provision them access into the system. Uh, using a tool, you can automate these workflows. And you should absolutely include a step for compliance checks. This is where you run a preventative risk assessment and those results are returned. And prior to ever provisioning access to the systems, you address those risks, meaning you either do a remediation, so you're going to take away some of the access so that the risk is not present, or you're going to go ahead and mitigate that in advance. That means no one ever gets new access provision to your system before the risk has already been addressed. So we are ensuring no net new risk to our environment that's not already cleaned and addressed. Enabling certifications of access. Um, access requests, that's going to be our join or move or leave or right. People are coming in, they're getting access, um, they're changing jobs. We're great at doing all of that. But especially when people back others up for a certain period of time when moving jobs, we run into stale access. So this is where someone you know, was doing two jobs for a set period of time. Um, they may no longer need it, but do we have visibility to that? Certifications are the ability for us to go back and look at the access someone has at um, a set time and just revalidate that it's necessary for them to keep it or go ahead and revoke that and clean up their access. So again, this is going back to the concept of least privilege. Give them the access they need to do their job and nothing more. And with <clears throat> excuse me, with certifications, we also want to layer in the concept of risk. So as I'm recertifying the access for my users, I want to see what risks are caused because if I'm granted a role and it's not causing me a risk, I'm far less concerned about that role than the role that's causing two or three separation of duties risks for me, right? Um, so we wanna make sure that we're also taking that into account when we're doing our certifications. Revalidate, users need to keep the access, but if you can, bring in, bring in the risk results. And some tools like ours will do that automatically for you, or if you're doing it manually, you could refer back to your assessment reports that you've created so that you can bring that into, for example, your spreadsheets. Enabling elevated access management. So elevated access management, you might also hear it called emergency access management, privileged access management, PAM, EAM, firefighter. They are all the same concept, which is the ability to, for a temporary time-bound period, check out additional access beyond what you have in your typical end user ID and use that elevated access. And then um, after it being approved, and then after the time bound period, it's revoked automatically. And then you also want to do um, change logging of that. So why is that important? If we just think about least privileged again, there are activities that people need to do, but maybe they don't need to do it frequently enough that it needs to be standing access in their end user account. The examples I would use are things like opening and closing the system for IT changes, GL open and close of periods, certain year end, finance tasks, right? 
people do need to do this as part of their job, but they don't need to do it every day of the year, nor do they necessarily need access every day of the year. So um, this typically aligns really nicely with the sensitive access rule set or the critical access risks that we've defined. So we can take those and because we've done our get clean phase, we have the assessment report that shows us all the users with access to that sensitive information. And we can use that as a starting place to start building out these elevated access um, IDs and roles that we want people to check out instead of having that access sit in their IDs every time. So that's a great opportunity to, again, lower our risk um, exposure in our environment by using something like this. And then um, usage based ongoing risk remediation, we can always get better, right? So especially if we're able to track usage data within our different applications, we can take a look and see, do we have a risk provision to a user? Is Carrie creating vendors and paying vendors? So she has the risk, but when we actually look at her usage, she hasn't created or changed a vendor in months. Why does she still need that access? That's a pretty good indication that we could take that away from her. And now, not only are we following least privileged access principles, but we've gone ahead and we've cleaned up more risk from our environment um, because we're not being exposed to that unnecessarily. So that's how we stay clean and make sure that we don't introduce net new risk into our environment while continuing to clean up and, and reduce our, our risk exposure. And then lastly is optimize. This is where, um, you know, once you've really enacted all these processes and procedures, we're just looking at ways that we can get better, right? So things like business roles, this is a collection of roles, typically based on job type, and it just simplifies the um, assignment of roles out to users. To do this effectively, you really need to standardize your job titles and the access you expect users to do. So you really need to clean up your business processes, but this can be great and it can really make it efficient for assigning out access to users whenever you have users changing positions or new users starting. Um, risk quantification. Um, Pathlog does offer risk quantification. This is fairly unique in the industry. And what this does is things like the ability to say, well, Carrie's had access to create a vendor and pay a vendor all year long, but did she ever actually pay the same vendor that she created? If she did, hey, I have a report of it. It was on this day at this time, she paid vendor ABC a total of X amount of dollars, right? That's risk quantification. So again, that's getting fairly advanced in your maturity to be able to get to that point because you really need to set up all your baseline things first that we just talked through and get clean and stay clean. But this can be a really excellent advancement of that and a significant amount of cost savings, right? If I don't have to look at all you know, 500 users that have access to create vendors and pay vendors, I only have to look at the five who actually performed the risk and I can see the dollar amounts associated with it and dates and times that's gonna significantly reduce the amount of things that I have to audit, right, and monitor. So that's a great option. Um, enabling threat detection and vulnerability management. So again, limiting our risk exposure, taking a broader view of that, addressing it, um, and then things like license management for different applications. Licenses cost us a lot depending on the application that we're in. Um, so managing and monitoring those is a way that we can both um, maintain costs and, and save costs, but also ensure that we don't have um, over provisioning of licenses in our in our different applications. So in the interest of trying to wrap up quickly here, I'm going to move on to common pitfalls to avoid. I've mentioned a lot of these. Again, my goal here is to leave you guys with practical tips. So during implementation, make sure you fully realize your risks. Do your due diligence. Include custom transactions custom functionalities, things like that. Make sure you do your risk ranking with the business. Take into account cross-application conflicts. Build your mitigating controls out completely. Utilize elevated access management to monitor your super users. I can't stress this one enough. Loop your auditors in on anything that you're doing. If you try to do a whole project and you loop them in at the end, they have to review everything and they're not gonna wanna miss something. So they're gonna be extremely tedious in everything they go through. And I say that as someone who's been on both sides, the auditor and the project implementer. Um, if you loop them in from the beginning, every step along the way, loop them in as you build your rule set, as you get sign off on it, as you run your reports, as you do your, your mitigation of things, um, because they're able to see it in those small chunks and sign off on it as each piece goes, by the time you get to the end of your project, um, it's very simple for them to sign off because they've seen each step along the way. Um, ongoing support. Basically, once you've done all this effort, don't lose or waste what you've done. Make sure that you're maintaining it. So make sure that um, you're continuing to use your provisioning and 
using compliant provisioning. Like I said, risk assessments are great, but those are points in time. By implementing those into provisioning and making it a compliant process, you're ensuring that long-term you get to uh, continue to make use of that and you maintain that valuable un zero unmitigated risk status that you've established for your landscape. Similarly, maintain your rule sets. You build them. If someone builds something new in your environment, they introduce a new functionality, they create something new and custom, make sure you're assessing that and adding it to your rule set so your rule set stays up to date. Make sure all of this is documented. People come and go, they change positions. You get in new auditors or different auditors. You wanna make sure that all this is documented so that it's easily referenceable and you don't lose any of that um, training. And then, you know, continuous monitoring. Like I said, that's kind of the optimized step. When you can get there, it's great. It will definitely save you time, costs, and um, gain you efficiencies. What can PathLock offer you? I would be remiss if I did not uh, give ourselves a shout out for what we can do for you. So as you see here, this is a breakdown of our offerings. Application access governance, this is your access controls, a lot of what I just talked about today. Your risk analysis, that's your, your assessments, compliant provisioning, certifications, um, elevated access management, and role management. Continuous controls monitoring, this is that, um, that great addition of things like risk quantification, the ability to do change monitoring on your configurations, the ability to house and maintain your um, process controls, license management, and cybersecurity application controls. These are things like that vulnerability code scanning, transport control, state of loss prevention. And what do you stand to gain through automation? As I mentioned, I tried to make it specific, I tried to make it clear that you can do a lot of these things in a manual effort. Um, if you don't have the um, time or budget currently to do them in an automated fashion, but obviously we love to automate because it takes the unintentional human element out of things. And um, what can you gain through automation? These are some numbers that we've seen in our implementations. IT, 50% of your task reduction. What does that mean for you? That means you don't just have to keep the lights on anymore just because you're sitting there manually provisioning to who knows how many different systems and manually trying to gather together user access review reports. You can actually automate that, take it off your plate. Now you can focus on doing the things that bring a lot of value to the business. You can be supporting the business whenever they enter in those requests that say, hey, can you create this um, different report for me? Or is there a way that you can optimize this process that we're doing um, for the business? It really opens up the breadth of what you can do because you don't have to just keep the lights on every day. You can automate that part of your job. For our business users, you can see a 70% cost reduction. What do I mean by that? If provisioning goes from two weeks to two days, that 80 hours to eight hours, that's a pretty average reduction whenever you automate your provisioning um, because there's less emails going back and forth and the wait times while people are doing things, it's automatically provisioned. You don't have to have someone manually do it. Now, when you onboard someone, they're able to start working much quicker because they have that access immediately almost um, versus waiting weeks at a time to gain that. Similarly for user access reviews, if those are automated and you're not waiting on someone to manually compile them, you can review them quicker. And if the way that they're compiled automatically includes the complete access of the user in a singular view with the additional contextual information you need, is it causing a risk for this user? Um, you know, what access is the user executing within this um, particular assignment? You don't have to ping someone and ask them that and wait for them to get back to you. You can see it in the screen already. That makes it much quicker for you to perform that review. And similarly, when audit comes in, audit's not having to ask you, can you go grab me screenshots of you know, this access and these different things because audit can actually see uh, within the change logs of the tool, they can see all your approvals within the tool itself. So you aren't having to go pull all your emails and provide them back to them as evidence, right? So that's how you can see a significant reduction as a business user um, of your time and cost. And then internal controls and audit, I hit on this already, but when you've got a tool that's standardizing across applications, especially, you don't have to learn every different applications um, random process for taking screenshots or for documenting um, different processes and procedures because they're all following the same path within a standardized tool. So that's going to significantly speed up audit's ability to review things uh, because it's going to be one approach for all your applications and you've standardized it, standardized, um, you know, things like your, your uh, change logs and, and audit logs. So you can see a significant um, win there with with audit and especially when you get to that continuous controls monitoring where you're quantifying the risks so they don't have to look at 500 potential risks, just the five that actually happen, you will really see a reduction there. And 
Lastly, I will leave you with this. What should a comprehensive solution include to assist you in your governance journey? Life cycle management, a concept of audit compliance and zero risk, and continuous compliance monitoring, right? Make sure you've got application breadth and depth. You want to cover your whole landscape. Make sure that you can do things like that compliant provisioning. Once you once you do your get clean, don't waste that effort. Stay clean through implementing processes to maintain that environment that you've now set up. Um, take risk into account. Use things like role management, risk simulations, elevated access management to really continue to improve um, your, your risk posture by reducing your risk exposure. And then continuous controls monitoring, you know, continue to be compliant, utilize things that are available to you to minimize what people have to look at for the scope of their audits. And um, yeah, so all these features should enable you to get to those goals we talked about. So visibility across your landscape, governance of how you handle access and security so that you can follow through on those governance goals. And um, a solution that is gonna encompass all of these should set you up to succeed. So when we talk about overcoming complexities in your application landscape and having a successful risk assessment, um, this should be able to help you get there. So um, with that, I know I'm at uh, 10 minutes till the end of the hour. So I'm gonna turn it over to Stephanie for questions and wrap up. And thank you guys for sitting through this with me. Thank you so much, Carrie, for that presentation. Again, if you do have any questions, please add them to the questions box now. Our first question is, how would you get time with with the business to do things like risk rating? I love this question and I get this a lot actually, um, or something similar along similar lines. Whenever I do presentations like this, people are like, how do you actually get anyone to do the work with you? Um, in my experience, you need top down buy-in. Um, so, if you have executive sponsorship and they are on board for the project that you're performing, they're going to make it clear to those that work underneath them that they need to participate with you. So that's the first step. You need top-down buy-in. And then the second piece of that that I would say is that the same way that I've articulated here what the business or audit or IT stands to gain from a project like this, if you can similarly articulate that to whoever it is you're working with in the, in the business, um, they're going to see the value in it, right? Is it fun to sit there and go through every risk and rank it? No, but does it matter to the business? Absolutely, because if the business knows if this gets ranked critical, someone can't have the access, well, you better believe they're gonna care which risks get ranked as critical because they know what their users need to do in the system. And if something's going to prevent them from being able to do their job and their processes, they it matters to them. But likewise, um, if you show them the benefits they're going to get out of it, you know, hey, this provisioning, it will reduce our time by like two weeks. So when you actually start some new hire, one, we can automatically kick off as soon as they're entered in the HR system, it will go create them with their basic access and the applications so they can log in day one. And then any new access you need to assign to them that gets done in just like hours instead of days or weeks, they're going to see the value in it right? It makes it worth it to them. So that's how I would do it. Get top down buy-in first and then, um, you know, make an effort to articulate the value to the business and what they're going to get out of it by uh, helping you. Perfect. Our next question is you listed a lot of steps for a mature program, but if you're just starting and don't have a lot of bandwidth, what would be prioritized? I would start with exactly what the purpose of this was. So we talked about how do you assess risk, right? How do you get a good risk assessment of your environment? And it's that stay clean step. If you can't do anything else, do that. Build your risk rule set so you know what risk you care about finding in your environment and go run that report. Be it a manual report where you go pull the tables and you and you you know run a query to cross-reference things and get that report, but one way or the other, or you can work with um Tools like ours, obviously, um, there are consulting companies who um, can help you do that. But if you're doing it in-house, you could still do it. I've done it myself manually before, right? Where you pull the data tables and run reports. Get that baseline because it goes back to visibility. The most terrifying thing is not knowing what you don't know. So if you don't have visibility, you just do not know. For all you know, you could actually be in a pretty decent place, but you wouldn't know that if you don't have any way to report on it. So that is the first thing I would do. Go ahead, build your risk rule set and run your report and see where your environment stands today. And then you can start to work on cleaning it up and doing all the other stuff. Okay, perfect. That's all the time we have for questions today. 
If you do have any more questions, feel free to reach out to us at info at pathlock.com and we would be happy to reach back out to you for any of your questions. We, if you have want any more information, including we have, um, we were just in the latest Coopinger Coal report. It's found at pathlock.com. Pathlock was named a leader in two prestigious industry reports. So if you'd like to check that out, please go to pathlock.com. And if you have any more questions, I'm seeing a few here. Uh, we'll make sure that someone reach out, reaches out to you and answers your questions and you can reach out to us at info at pathlock.com. And with that, I just wanted to say thank you so much for coming and we hope to see you at future webinar events.